Welcome back. I'm Barbara Lee Edwards. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. Tonight we continue our election coverage on this special edition of News 8 at 10 on the CW. It's a team effort tonight. News 8's Marcella Lee is tracking both the Electoral College and the balance of power in Congress. Marcella, there's been quite a bit of back and forth tonight and the battleground states are very close. What can you tell us right now when it comes to the balance of power in the Senate? Beverly and Carlo, the balance of power in the Senate is at stake in tonight's election. Democrats trying to win control of the Senate, while Republicans are fighting hard to defend those seats and keep control. Let's take a look at the map, which shows the very latest in this tough fight. Right now, they are dead even. Well, we're seeing different results come in. This map has Democrats at 45, Republicans at 46. But when I just checked moments before we came on air, Democrats had gained one seat. So they have 46 now in a dead tie. Going into tonight, Republicans had a 47 to 53 majority with 35 Senate seats up for grabs. So with Democrats at 46 right now, they need to grab five more seats to get to 51 and guarantee control of the Senate. So tonight, eight seats remain uncalled and the races are so close in so many states. We've got Arizona, Montana, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, Maine, and Georgia. Georgia is kind of a peculiar state. It, they have two seats. Georgia has two seats at stake, and in a rare twist, both of those races could lead to a runoff if the candidate doesn't reach 50% of the vote. That are the, those are the rules there in Georgia, so it could really be a while before we know if the Democrats can steal control of the Senate from Republicans. Barb. All right, thanks, Marcella. We want to turn now to our News 8 political analyst, Wendy Patrick and Laura Fink, who've been with us all night, keeping an eye on the results as they come in. Thank you for joining us, Wendy. Laura, we want to talk now about our local congressional races, starting with the 50th District, which is extremely close right now, really too close to call. Daryl Issa spoke a little earlier tonight. He was optimistic, but, Wendy, I would have to say cautiously optimistic. Your thoughts on that? Barbara Lee, I think that's exactly right. Cautiously optimistic because let's face it, with all the races we've been covering all night long in this day and age, it's just not over until it's over. And with all the projections that we do and all the different kinds of exit polls that we think is going to predict the trajectory of these di different races, We've just been wrong. We're seeing that on the national stage. And you wonder whether there's some kind of a down ballot boom, I'll call it, is how much do national races and national candidates actually impact local races on the same ticket? So I don't know whether that's in play here or not. I don't know whether the dynamics of the district um, are counterintuitively sort of backfiring in a fashion that we wouldn't have, have expected. But I also know that there are a lot of votes to be counted. So we're going to have to wait this one out, particularly because it is just so close. There were a lot of elements involved going into this race with Duncan Hunter resigning and the race itself between Amar Kampanajar and Daryl Issa was so heated. There was a, probably the most mudslinging I saw in a local race in the political ads that were running on TV. Are you surprised, Laura, that this race is as close? as it is tonight? I, I don't know which way this is going to go, so I'm not surprised that it's close because, you know, as Wendy was suggesting, presidential coattails matter, and the dynamics of the national race has impact down ticket, particularly now because it affects turnout and affects who shows up to the polls. So with Joe Biden having a tremendous lead in California. That definitely spilled over and gave a little momentum to Amar Kampanajar's campaign in an otherwise, as, as Wendy likes to say, ruby red district. So definitely it's closer than it would normally be given the registration advantage in that district for Republicans. Now it was also a race where we saw quite a bit of money spent and that money was spent on negative ads. It really was about defining each, de each challenger, defining one another as being not good enough for the voters. So it, again, it doesn't look like Amar will have the ability to weather this, uh, weather this particular race because he needed a cushion to bounce off of because we know that as the, uh, the ballots roll in, they're more likely to lean conservative, more likely to be Daryl Issa voters. Another race I want to touch on quickly before we go is the 53rd race between Sarah Jacobs and Georgette Gomez, two Democrats running in this this one and uh, Laura just towards the end of it there was something that came out regarding Georgette Gomez and her taxes and not having paid some of them and her excuses for that and I'm wondering if you think that that played a role in the results that we're seeing so far tonight. 
Well, I, didn't th I don't think it did her any favors, but I think I'll, I'll give you another uh, money number, and that's $9 million. That's the amount of money that Sarah Jacobs and the supporters of her campaign, that's, that's personal money or money from the family. And, and Georgette Gomez really only had a fraction of that. That enabled Sarah Jacobs to define the race, to highlight things uh, like that tax uh, issue for Georgette, and to really consolidate the vote. Uh, what she did, what Barbara Bree was not able to do, it appears, which is to consolidate consolidate the conservatives in that, which there are, you know, like not quite a third, maybe a quarter, consolidate the conservative base, build it out into Democrats, and really just drown the airwaves uh, with positive and negative messaging to capture that district once in a generation that we see seats like this come up. Um, and Sarah Jacobs uh, looks like she is holding the day. Her second time running for this one, and it looks like she is getting the job done this time. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us with your insight tonight, and we'll talk to you a little later. Thank you. The polls closed hours ago, but as we've seen, it still could be some time before a winner is declared in the presidential late, uh, race. Could be days, even weeks, some people think. News 8's Lamore Abrams has more from a political expert who's watching things very closely and talks about the potential legal challenges. We're back with Thad Kowser, political science professor at UCSD, and we're going to get straight to the potential legal challenges brewing here. Battlegrounds are tight, assuming one candidate sweeps all by narrow margins. Will it even settle this election? Well, if we get to a final vote count, and remember, we've got until December 14th for states to finalize their vote count and those electors to cast their ballots. Uh, close wins in American politics if you have an uncontested final vote count. We saw that with Donald Trump cobbling up together these narrow majorities in three states to win a large electoral college victory. But here's where this night and we could be headed, we've got a few really close states. Uh, so North Carolina is really close. That's one of those states with a pending legal case about will the Republicans challenging the counting of ballots cast, according to state relations now, that are sent in the mail, postmarked on or before Election Day. Same thing with, with Pennsylvania. If we get to a preliminary vote count and those states are really close, those cases could matter. Okay, so at this point, how likely is it that we'll see the Supreme Court intervene like it did back in 2000? Again, we don't really have any new information tonight, right? The states that we thought were going to be landslides were landslides. There's no big Joe Biden early knockout punch. So Democrats are disappointed and anxious about that. But those key states for Joe Biden, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, still too close to call. And, and we're not going to have a clear idea for at least 24 hours in those states because those mail ballots still have yet to be counted. So we will have zero closure when we go to bed tonight. Zero closure, but but we knew that we knew we needed to be patient and and elections and getting it right is more important than getting it early. Good way to close it out. Thank you so much, Beth Kowser at UCSD. Well, as we mentioned, it is shaping up to be a historic election here in San Diego. The county registrar says more than one million ballots have been cast countywide before Election Day. Uh, almost half of the two million people registered in the county. Early in-person voting allowed tens of thousands of San Diegans to cast their ballots over the weekend. And today it looks like things are going well. News 8's Richard Allen is live at the Registrar of Voters tonight. Always a busy place with an update on what it's like there now. Richard. Well, Carlo and Barbara Lee, this place has been hopping all day and it will be hopping all night too. Now, when the polls close at eight o'clock, actually there was a little bit of a celebration. Balloons dropped. You can see some of those balloons behind me here. But now the hard work continues in tabulating those results. We have some video actually to show you of some of the trucks coming in, bringing in those ballots from the 235 Super Bowl locations. The question outstanding right now, though, is will this be a record breaking election here in the county as far as overall voter turnout goes? We already know that we have broken records this time around in terms of mail-in ballots being uh, being uh, processed. Keep in mind, though, this time around, we have 300,000 more voters on the rolls than we did back in San Diego County back in 2016. Back then, voter turnout for that election was 81%, so we'll just have to wait and see until all the ballots here are tallied to determine whether or not that record is shattered. Now, right now, 
Michael Vu, the registrar of voters, tells us that he foresees anywhere from an 80 to 85 percent voter turnout for the entire county. But we'll just have to wait and see. Right now, though, they are focused tonight on tabulating those ballots that were cast today in person here at the registrar and at the 235 super polls throughout the county. And that work could last well into the wee hours of the morning. Here's what Michael Vu had to say about the future of counting those ballots. First thing tomorrow morning, we're going to be back at it again, making sure that we've scanned in, getting a, a really a, a, a lay of the land as to how many mail ballots have been dropped off at the respective polling locations today or at the super uh, mail ballot drop off locations as well, plus how many provisional ballots were cast as well. Very busy. So all of those ballots will not be tabulated, not for the next few days, but actually in the next few weeks. In fact, if you mailed in your ballot today, as long as it was postmarked by today and it's received by the registrar within 17 days by November 20th, it will be counted before this election is officially certified a month from today on December 3rd. Carlo and Barbara Lee. All right, Richard Allen, thanks. Good to see things going smoothly. A hub of activity tonight. They did so much to make it easy for people to war, uh, vote in this circumstance, and it's a huge success. We'll be back with more after this.